Thanks, Pastor. Good morning, church. Good morning to everyone over there at Suntech as well. You know what? It's December, so you are now legally allowed to wish one another a Merry Christmas. So please, please wish one another a Merry Christmas for me, okay? And uh, I know it's, I say this every week, but really for any of us who has this opportunity to preach the Word of God, we really are very excited to bring the Word of God. And this season, I'm really excited because we are, we are in December. And I, like I said, this year, we want to do something special. We're having a, a Christmas sermon series so that all month long, I know I was just talking to some pastors uh, last night. We know that many people were traveling for vacation and stuff. So sometimes they may miss different Christmas messages, which is why this year, it's very fun that every week is going to be all about Christmas. So make sure let's continue to invite our friends and, and they're going to be tremendously blessed as we come and receive from the Lord this Christmas season. And so as we enter into December, for the next four weeks, we're starting this brand new sermon series, just a, a four-part series. And this series, I've called it, What's So Merry About Christmas? What's really so merry about Christmas? And I believe that all of us, we have, the, we have different understandings of what Christmas is. Christmas has different significance to each and every one of us. And I believe if I ask you this question, what's so merry about Christmas? We'll say the different things. Some of us will say it's the presents, it's the, it's the parties, it's the lights, the people, uh, the music, the atmosphere. But there are some people in this time of the year, when it's expected to be a joyful season, it's expected to be a festive season, when people are supposed to be celebrating, that if you ask them this question, what's so merry about Christmas? Their answer would be that same question, yeah, what's so merry about Christmas? What is there to be merry about during this season? You see, Christmas really is a very big celebration. In my opinion, at least in, in Singapore, I feel that, you know, Christmas is, it can almost be on par, definitely it's not the same, but it's almost on par as Chinese New Year. Why? Look at, the, look at the amount of effort put into it. The entire streets will be closed to put up lightings, to put up decorations. Entire shopping centres will change their facade. They'll build things. They will invest a lot of money. Look at different corporations. They will, they will spend money to send Christmas cards to all their clients and things like that. There is something very celebratory about it. And if you missed out on, 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 on if you have not seen what's going on in, the, in terms of decoration and everything, there's one thing that will always happen every year. Before you, you might even see any Christmas decoration, you will always hear Christmas music first. We will always end up hearing Christmas music. How many of you here, you love Christmas music? You love Christmas carols? Over at Santa as well. Okay, quite, quite a lot of you. You know, I love Christmas music. Okay, I love it. I love it as much as, as, as the next guy. But... I have a very strong conviction that Christmas music cannot start earlier than December. It cannot start in November, and it definitely cannot start in October. And I want to quote the good book on this, because the good book, the Word of God says something very important. It says, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. October is not the time and the season for Christmas uh, 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 carols, all right? Only in December then we're allowed, all these shopping centres are allowed to, to spam that music. I know uh, for Serene and I, we've been going to the supermarkets. And the, I tell you, the last few months have been an ordeal going to the supermarket. Because every time we go to the supermarket near our place, they are, they've been blasting Christmas music since October. Okay, and every time we go shopping, we're trying to find vegetables and stuff, they're blasting Christmas music. And you know what? It's not just... What the bad thing is not that they are blasting Christmas music. The bad thing is that they're blasting bad Christmas music. It's 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 all the I don't know where they get these recordings from. It sounds it sounds terrible. The people sing it, it sounds very weird. And I know I'm I'm very I just want to say a little bit about this. You know, since I since I got a platform now, I can make a public service announcement. But I think it's very important that we we must really watch this and every of you here you own any shops or whatever, please don't play it too long, don't play music, uh, Christmas music too early. You know, because in Singapore, right, if you keep playing Christmas music for a long period of time, uh, we will end up in a situation where four or five months continuously we'll be hearing festive music. You know why? Especially coming to 2017. I guarantee you the moment after 31st December. 2016. We go into 1st January 2017. What are we going to hear? See, you know, it's going to be. Guys, this is a serious epidemic here, okay? This is going to go on all the way until February, so brace yourselves, alright? But, but seriously though, I don't. 
we talk about this, it brings us a smile. We're, we're laughing at this. Some of us, we really do love hearing Christmas music. It brings us joy when we hear it. But we need to ask ourselves, what makes us so merry during this Christmas time? Well, I hope that over the next four weeks, we can start to allow the Lord to come and move in our lives, allow the Lord to speak to us and reveal to us what Christmas really is all about and why it's so merry. And so as we start this next uh, four sermons, this week, I want to start off sharing a message with us called All Wrapped Up. All Wrapped Up. See, what's so merry about Christmas? One, one, one thing that makes people happy is that Christmas is a time where, where everything is nicely wrapped up. We've got all kinds of, of nice decorations, nice looks, and of course, wrapping is something that we're very familiar with when it comes to Christmas. Why? Because we give one another presents, right? And we always uh, 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 wrap up those presents. And when you go to a shopping mall, a shopping center, and as you check out with all your goods, they will always have a wrapping station and they'll sell you all kinds of wrapping paper. You see, wrapping, is, wrapping paper is very important because we want to give everything this festive look. Presents are given this festive wrapping paper. Just like, you know, when we, when, we, when we give one another gifts in Christmas, right? We're very particular about the kind of wrapping paper that we use. We're trying to find a more festive looking one, something with green, red, uh, gold. Uh, we won't give, we won't wrap some, a Christmas present with birthday cake wrapping paper, right? Here, here Merry Christmas. It doesn't quite make sense. And same thing, down the streets, we're going to decorate it. We're going we're gonna to wrap our shopping centers such, in such a way that they look festive. They have this nice decoration. Even in our homes, we start to, so, so to speak, wrap up our homes. We start to give it a nice exterior look. We put up our Christmas tree. We hang the decorations. We, we add, add, maybe if we don't have a Christmas tree, at least we'll put on a Christmas wreath on our door. And sometimes maybe that's the problem about the Christmas season. See, it's a time where we become so focused on what happens on the exterior. We become so focused on how Christmas looks rather than what Christmas really is all about. We look at Christmas on the outside, but we forget about what Christmas is on the inside. And today, I want to share with us two problems I noticed during this festive season. Two problems that I think it always existed, but it becomes more amplified during this festive period. So what are these two things? I want to share with us. The first thing is this. The first problem I can identify during this festive period is number one, we as human beings, we like the superficial. We actually do like the superficial things of this world. What does superficial mean? Or what is, what is superficiality all about? It means that we're more concerned about things that happen and exist on the surface or on the exterior. So we say, oh, it's a very superficial outlook of things. It means that we're not getting to the depth of the, the, deep, the, the, the root of the issue. We're looking at things on the exterior, on the surface only. And let's face it, sometimes Christmas is exactly like that. We focus on the exterior only. We look at Christmas on the surface only. And that's something that we've learned from today's culture. You know, like I said just now, if you're too busy to realize that we've come to the end of the year, just look around, just listen out. Everybody's busy wrapping up things. The, the streets are wrapped up with lights and so on and so forth. Everything is being decorated. We can see the external looking of Christmas. And I know for Serene and I, sometimes we'll, we'll drive through, actually most every year we do this, we'll drive through Orchard Road, we'll take a look at, at some of the lights and we'll give our opinions about the lights. Well, this year the light is very ugly, this, this is the light quite nice and so on and so forth. We'll see all this and you see so much effort being put into the external facade of what Christmas is all about. And I, the thing is this, I believe that over time, all of us here as human beings, any, regardless of our upbringing, we all end up in a, at a point of time in our lives where we don't realize it, but we like these superficial things. We like, we, we focus on all these exterior things. For example, we, we, do, we, we are quite superficial, you know. Okay, I think we are quite superficial. We, we generally like to make sure that we dress appropriately, we dress well, we want to look, make sure that we look good. But let me give you a very classic example when it comes to Christmas to show how we actually like the superficial things of this world. Let me ask you, how many of us here, you enjoy receiving Christmas presents? Honest to God. Okay, you're in church, right? Okay, Santa, how many of you love receiving Christmas presents? Okay, most, almost all of us love receiving Christmas presents. Does that therefore make us superficial people? No, it doesn't, you know. What actually makes us superficial is the next thing I'm going to say. The problem is not that we like to receive Christmas presents. The problem that makes us superficial is this. We like to receive good Christmas presents. 
Receiving presents is not an issue. It's receiving good presents. We're actually okay if, I, if, if we don't receive presents, we don't really make a big deal out of it. We're fine. But we, make a, we kind of fuss a little bit when we receive presents that are, are, are not good. We want to receive presents that, that, uh, are, that are good. And every time we get those presents, you know, and, and sometimes we open it up and we feel a little bit disappointed and all of that. And then we, we, we come to this conclusion, um, okay, la, I, I, get, I guess it's the thought that counts. Does it really count? Um, I don't know. Some of us, you know, we, when we say, oh, actually, there's a thought that counts, we're kind of saying that, oh, okay, I'll give you A for effort, but maybe you should try harder next year. Some of us receive our gifts, and we really mean it from the depths of our heart. We say, oh, you shouldn't have, you know. Um, that, that's, okay, I'll give you some time for that, but that's, that's the struggle of, of this season. And, you know, that's, that's the next part that we can see how superficial we are, is the reactions that we give when we receive a gift. Someone gives us a gift, and, and we, we give that. We give that fake smile. Okay? That's why sometimes Christmas can be a very superficial season. We receive a gift, but we don't actually like the gift, and we're like, hey, thanks. You know, it, it's, it's, you can smile. It, you know how the, the superficial smile, how we superficially smile, right, is when we're so caught up with smiling that we put all our energy there that our mouth doesn't move. Okay? We smile, right, and we talk, Hey, thank you so much. You know, it's so all energy smiling there. It's like, oh, you shouldn't have. Oh, <laughs> yeah, hey, thanks. Uh, and deep inside, you're like, what, am I, what, what on earth am I going to do with this? What am I going to do with another tie, another scarf? Okay, and then you go to your, your thing. And, and, and okay, um, no judgment here. I know some of us recycle our gifts. Okay, we, we, we receive the present. After all, we receive so many bad gifts that we open our presents very gingerly. Okay? So that you don't ruin the wrapping, so that possible, oh, you can stick it back and you can go to some other party and use it as a gift exchange. Okay? We've, we've done that before. All right? We've done that before. But see, that, that is the, that's how superficial we can get. And it's worse when it comes to children. You know, remember when, you, when we were children, when we were young, you love receiving a present. Okay? It's nothing more than the kid loves to receive a box with wrapping paper and just rip apart. And you, you know, kids are very violent. Just they, they rip because they're so excited. They rip it apart. And imagine this, you know, as a kid, you get a present, you know, you get a present, oh, I'm so excited. And, and, and you rip it up and you see the big smile and then they open up that box and then it's like soap and shampoo. Okay? And, and what happens to the kid? The kid like, you can see the kid kind of like just sing something. Something died inside that kid right there, okay? Something just, just like, that life just got snuffed out right there. And you know what's worse? Then, when the kid receives the present, right, the father or mother will always be there, right? And what would the father or mother say? What must you say? And the kid, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> See, that's, that's how it is in Christmas. And isn't this the truth? I remember once I was reading an article written by a pastor. And this pastor said, you know, sometimes the Christmas season has become nothing more than the consumer season. Consumerism is something that's very big in this day and age. That everything is about what we can get. It, we have become that reason for this. And we are looking at what we can get out of this, uh, out of this season. And that's why the Word of God talks about this as well. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, it says this, For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. Isn't that true? When the more we live in this world, the more we are exposed to these superficial things, we actually do like these things. We actually have a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for the things we see. We, we, we take pride in our possessions. But the Word of God says these things are not from the Father. These superficial things are not from the Father. No, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that these things are bad. I'm not saying that we cannot have any kind of blessings in this world. I'm not saying that we cannot have uh, uh, material possessions in this world. But the truth is this, it cannot be the main focus of our lives. It cannot overtake the more important things that are in our lives. I remember just, 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 just last week, you know, I was, 
it was quite, it was quite random, or rather it's not random. I think, I think the Holy Spirit was just speaking through me. It happened when I was preaching at our, at our Mandarin service last week. I was preaching at our Mandarin service in Mandarin, and I was preaching, and, and if you remember last week's sermon, I talked about let go, as to let go of our, our, our treasure, and I was preaching there. As I was preaching up here, the Lord suddenly gave me a word in Mandarin, which very seldom happens. I always think in, in English, and then I translate it to Mandarin. And he, he told me, because we were, we were preaching about how we must let go of our Thai Pao, our, our, our treasure. So I was standing here, and out of, out of the blue, I don't know, I just said this. I said, this is the lesson we must learn about Thai Pao, treasure lah, Thai Pao. Yo jiu hao, mei you hai hao, yo ye su zui hao. Wow, no, not bad for, for... It's pretty good for... Pretty good for Anglo-Chinese school boy, okay? Anglo being the important word there. Uh, but that, that's the truth, right? When it comes to our treasures, earthly riches, earthly gains, there's nothing bad with it. If you have it, well, that's good. If you don't have it, it's still fine. But what's most of, important of all is that we must have Jesus. And that's what this season is all about. The world wants to tell us that the season is about riches, about receiving gifts, everything. But you know what? The Bible tells us that it is about receiving the most important gift of all. And that is Jesus. That's why Christmas is a time where we celebrate Jesus coming into this world. And so that's the first problem I realized. Number one, that we like the superficial. We do like it. But the thing is, if we continue to allow the superficial things of this world to consume us, it leads to a bigger problem. And that's the second problem I realized. That once we like the superficial and we start getting consumed by the superficial, the second problem is this. We end up at a place where we start to live for the superficial. We no longer just like it anymore. We start to live our entire life for the superficial things around us. We live our entire life so that we can gain material possession. We, can end, we end up living for these things. And that's why it's called consumerism. Uh, consumerism, of course, the idea is that, oh, we, we consume product, we consume uh, uh, these things. But you know what? We don't really consume these things. These things actually consume us. That's why I think consumerism is such an appropriate word. Let's look at the kind of things we're exposed to from the moment we're young. I mean, we watch television or everything. Just watch any kind of advertisement on the, on, the, on the TV. What does it say? It always says, it tells the, the guys, you know, buy this cologne and you'll be surrounded by ladies. Or, or women, use this soap and use this shampoo and all the men will come after you because they like to smell you apparently. Or they'll say this, you know, drive this particular car and you will find that you're very successful. You know, we're so exposed to these kind of things. This is the kind of imagery that we are, we've grown up with and we're, we're given, and it's always like that. For example, you know, you talk about, talk about a car advertisement. Every time you talk about a car advertisement, you talk about, I don't know, whatever it's a Mercedes-Benz, an Audi, a BMW, or, or whatever, they will always show some guy driving it. But this guy driving it is always what? In a suit. In, in dress very fancy. He always, wear, always has a briefcase. I don't know what's in the briefcase. Nobody uses a briefcase anymore. But he's always ha carrying a briefcase. It's, just, it's like... If you have this car, you will be successful. doesn't matter if you're in debt for the rest of your life, but you know you have this car, that, that's success right there. That's the kind of impression that we seem to be given. When was the last time you saw a BMW or a Mercedes uh, uh, um, or an Audi advertisement where, you know, you see the car well, you know, all sleek and black, and you know, it's, you know it, it just like rotates on that thing, and then there's a light shining, well, you, know, you know, they always talk about, then they always, they always describe the car as one word, you know, elegant sophisticated, beautiful, magnificent. Then the door opens up. And you see someone in FBT shorts and singlet and blue and white slippers plop, 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 walk, walking into the car. You don't see that. Why? Because the world is teaching us to live for these superficial things. Have this, you'll be successful. Have that, you'll be liked. Have this, you, you, you will be successful. And so on and so on. It keeps going on like that. That is the life that we live in. And you know, very, a few months ago, I was preaching on this topic here about being authentic. And during that sermon, I remember sharing this, this observation I've made in our world today. I said this, you know, I said, the world craves for authenticity, but yet creates forgeries. In as much as there's a great desire for authenticity, there's an equal or even greater demand for forgery. Think about that for a moment. We live in a world right now that is so superficial was so superficial that one of the biggest markets or industries around the world is an industry that specializes in creating imitation goods. 
knockoff goods. That is one of the biggest markets around the world. Why? Because people not only want all these branded things, but if they can't afford these branded things, they want people to think that they can afford these branded things. That's what I mean by we live for the superficial things of this world. And like it or not, these are some things that we are brought up with. It ends up being ingrained into us, you know. Uh, and I'm not saying all these things does not apply to just older people, people who have started work and all that. It applies to young people as well. I remember this, this happened to me when I was in uh, secondary school. I think I was, I was sec two or sec three, so 14, 15 years old. And I remember I went out and I, I was not very... I grew up not being very particular about what I, 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 I wore, you know, like my watches or, or, or whatever. So I remember I went to find, I, I needed a watch. And so I went to, to, to find, I wanted to buy a watch, but obviously at sec, three, sec, four, uh, sec 2, Sec 3, I couldn't afford to go to some proper watch shop. So as a student, where do you go to buy things that you can afford? You go to Boogie Street. Lah. So I went to Boogie's, I went to the markets there, and I found this watch, okay, which I had no idea was... Uh, uh, I mean, I don't know it was a knockoff, lah, so I just bought it, okay? Turns out it was a knockoff of a new Swiss Army watch. And it was very interesting. It was a metallic watch, had a very unique design, very beautiful uh, uh, colour and everything. And it was a very unique design such that people from far can tell that I'm wearing a very special looking watch. So I remember I went to school and everybody started asking me, hey, this watch you're wearing, it's, 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 it's very nice. And then what is it? They look at the logo, oh, a new Swiss Army watch, it must be, must be, it must be very expensive. And I don't know why, as a... I was 14, 15 years old. They said, it must be very expensive. And I just said, hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I guess, hmm, because it's... I didn't really say yes, so you can't hold me to that, but I wanted to give the impression. And so people kind of... So people started going around to school you know, and saying that, hey, hey, Daniel Kong has this very nice, very nice watch. People from other classes were coming to look for me because they wanted to see that watch, okay? It's actually... It was a pretty good knockoff watch, okay? And people kept seeing it, and there was a, there's like a, a, a big commotion over it. Until one day, another student came to school, except that he had the real watch. <laughs> it was given as a gift by one of his family members. Now, this watch was actually, apparently, I didn't know it was a pretty expensive watch. Why? Because there's one key difference between the, my watch and his watch, other than the fact that, okay, mine, mine looked nice on the outside, but you turn the inside out, it's like, oh, looks terrible on the inside, lah. Okay? Not just don't, don't talk about the quality of the build, but the biggest difference is this, that on the metal clasp, okay, the real one has a diamond. Okay? And, so, and so when he wore that, that watch to school, people started going to him, hey, Daniel, the guy has the same watch, you know, yeah? Same one, right? Yeah, yeah, it's the same one. You got a diamond underneath, right? <laughs> that I do, you know? Uh, Yes, yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, 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 correct, same one. Then I don't know why they kept trying to get me to meet up with the other guy <laughs> so that we can show to everybody how nice our watches look together. I don't understand what was the concept there. Okay? And they kept making a big deal out of it and people kept saying, hey, you're the same watch, got the same watch, got the same watch. Until finally, one day I just stopped wearing the watch. Okay? And I look back, I think about it, I was not some grown up, I was not working, I was not in, but at that young age, I already had this feeling that, hey, that watch, whether it's a real thing or not, that, that bugs me. That makes me, that's where I get some of my worth from. That I felt good that when people thought I actually had this expensive thing and people were like, wanted to see it, I felt good about myself. And then when actually, when, when, when I when, when finally came to, to terms with that, mine is, mine is fake and some other guy had the real thing, I started feeling very down about myself. I started feeling embarrassed. Why? Because without intentionally doing it, I've ended up in a point where I'm living for the superficial things in this world. And many of us are the same thing. There's some things that we're just ashamed of. We wish we had a better thing. We wish we had something else as greater. Or we wish we look at someone else's thing and say, you know what, if only, if only I had something as good as, as, as he owns or she owns. And we are living for these things. And very often that's the culture we've created in this world. We live in this world that we've, we've been directly or indirectly taught that our confidence, our worth comes from the superficial things around us. It comes from the things that we own it comes from the things that we have done. That's why many of us were so fixated on our careers, on being successful. We're so fixated on earning more money, on buying more things. Or we're so fixated on how good the world thinks we are. 
You know, recently, what, we, what do we just have? What was very prominent in the newspapers very recently? We just had our PSLE results being released, right, for the primary six kids. And I remember I was, I was just surfing online and I went to the Straits Times website and on their website, there's a whole section dedicated to PSLE results and everybody writing their opinions, they're writing articles and sometimes we live in a world where, well, you know, results come out and we're so fixated on these results. We want to talk so much about these results. We want to look at, hey, how much do you score? You score this, that means it's good. You score that, it means lousy. If you score this, you can go to a good school. If you didn't score that, you will end up in a bad school. We talk so much about this. Why? Because we end up living for these superficial things. And there's something that I fell into this before, and many of us do, but the more I work with, with the youth and the younger people in our church, this is something that I cannot accept. We all have this running joke. We all know in, in Singapore, if you go to ITE, what do we say? It's the end. Why do we do things like that? Why do we make jokes like that? Why do we make jokes? This should not be the case. But the fact is, we make jokes like that because we live for the superficial thing. And I will not stand and allow any of our youth to feel that way. In fact, more and more, that's why we're trying to talk about all the, 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 the about how people are successful and coming out of these uh, 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 of places like IT or, or, or poly. I remember when, when I was. I remember this, 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 I just suddenly remember this funny thing. Um, when I was going to poly, even back then, poly was a little bit frowned upon. Uh, uh, you know, kind of JC was the route to go. You know, not everyone should go uh, uh, poly. If you don't make the JC, then you end up in poly. So I remember was one day, I went back to my secondary school. Okay, I was already a poly student. And I went back to my scout unit, okay, my, my boy scout unit. And they were having an overseas trip. They were all going to... To, to, to New Zealand for what we, if any of scouts you know here, we have things we call jamboree. So they went for this uh, uh, trip together. And I wanted to go, but I couldn't. Okay? And I remember one parent of the boy came up to me, you know. Okay, this parent came up to me and said, Hey, Daniel, how come you're not going with them? Uh? I said, Oh, ma'am, I can't, I can't go because uh, uh, I'm studying in poly now. It's, it's like reaching my exam period. And she said, It's okay, la. just keep school. Uh. Poly only what? <laughs> she said that to me, you know, and I stood there, I was like, but this is the reality of this society that we've created. We live for all these superficial things. Bad school means you're a terrible person. Good school means, oh, you're going to be a success. We have ended up in situations like that. And it's just like what the Word of God says. Again, let's come back to 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, pride in our achievements, pride in our possessions, but these things are not from the Father. They are from this world. And so we live for these superficial things. But are these the things that really, do we need them? And I'm sure many of us, maybe you've grappled with this before. We reach a point in our life where we say, you know what, there has to be something more than this. Life has to have more than this. We, we come to a point where we feel a certain sense of emptiness or uneasiness within us. And no amount of money can offload that. No amount of, of success can remove that emptiness. But you know what? Today I want to tell you that God can. God can remove that. And here's what His Word says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 10. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. That's the danger about living for these superficial things. Because when we just live for the superficial things, we miss out on something very important. We're so focused on the superficial things that we have missed out on the supernatural things of this world. We have missed out on the spiritual things of this world. You know, I, I've, I've always taught this. There's something very interesting about us. We are called human beings. We are a being. We have, we're not called human bodies. Why? Because we exist not just at the physical level, but yet we always focus on things on the physical level, we, we, we find it's important. Look after yourself. Phys we, look, we, are, we are concerned about our physical health. We're concerned about our emotional health. We're concerned about our mental health. But why aren't we concerned about 
our spiritual health? Why aren't we con- uh, 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 um, focusing on what's within us? Why, aren't, why do we just look at the superficial things? And so Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? So what if we gain all, the, all that the world has to offer us? So what if we gain all the riches, all the superficial things of this world? So what if we gain all the things that the world says are the markers of success? So what if we have all these things, but we lose our soul, we lose our spirits? What gain is there? Now, I like what we read in, in, in 1 Timothy just now. It's so, it's so interesting. And it's so... If anything, it's, it's contrary to what we understand in this world. It says that contentment is great gain. Contentment is great gain. When we live for the superficial, we're never going to think that way, you know? Because we're saying, a superficial way of living will say that I need more things. I need more money. I need more success. I need more power. I need more of this, more of that. We want, we, we want to work for that again. But the Lord here says, so what if you get all that but you lose your soul? Do you actually gain anything? No, if anything, contentment in God. That in itself is great gain. You see, in the end, all these superficial things we have around us, all these superficial things we surround ourselves with, these things, they don't fill that emptiness within us. They don't give us that purpose that we're looking for. They don't help us experience passion and love in our life. In fact, very often, because we're lacking these things, we try to compensate more and more with these superficial things. We try and, have, have more, we try and wrap ourselves up. Like I said, this message is called All Wrapped Up. Some of us, we are the ones that are all wrapped up. We wrap ourselves with more and more layers. Layers, or we, we think that, that emptiness can be countered by wrapping ourselves up with a layer of successful career, a layer of great wealth, a layer of relationships, a layer of riches, and so on and so forth. But you know, the truth is this. We can look good on the outside. We can seem fine on the outside. We can have riches, but yet still, still feel unfulfilled. We can be successful in the world's eyes, but yet we still feel like a failure on the inside. We can have, a, we can have many relationships, but yet not experience what what love actually is. Just because things look fine on the outside doesn't mean that they're fine on the inside. Have you ever received presents during the Christmas season? A very nicely wrapped present. Well, nice wrapping paper. It's got a nice bow on it. The person put a nice card there and you, you, you open it up and you take out that gift and you are sorely disappointed at that gift. You, I don't know, you... You, you thought, ah, oh, this guy must have bought me a, a watch or something, you know, a, a real watch with a diamond and all. Uh, and you're very excited about it. But you open up and it was a fruitcake, okay? Uh, I, 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 in case anybody wants to buy me a gift, I hate fruitcakes. I really hate fruitcakes. And every year I get many fruitcakes. Okay, so um, I don't know. I guess that's, that's, uh, that's my, 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 my path to walk in my life. But notice this. I can take the lousiest gift, the worst gift in the world, okay? I can take a pile of garbage, I can put it in a box, the nicest box in the world. I can wrap it up. I can put layers and layers of beautiful wrapping paper. I can tie it with a nice bow. I can, I can, I can do whatever. I can decorate. I put handwritten drawings, uh, handwritten messages. I can put drawings on it. You know, I can even go and, go, and, go and buy one of those very nice expensive colognes, you know, spray, make it look very nice and everything, okay? And then when I give it to you, I... I, I make sure I put it in a, in a nice metal case, you know, it must protect the gift, it's so valuable. But when you open it up, it's garbage. All that wrapping paper, all that fancy exterior will not change what it is on the inside. It will not change what it is on the inside. And that's the same thing for our lives today. We can have all, uh, out of our quest for for living for these superficial things. We can have so many layers of all these things, but you know what? All these things will not change who we are on the inside. If we are struggling with the emptiness, we will continue the emptiness because those things will not solve that. If we're struggling with loneliness, if we're struggling with, with, with anxiety, we're struggling with fear, those things will not 
help us. Because just because we look fine on the outside doesn't mean that we're fine on the inside. But that's the deception, the, the deception that we end up living with in this world. Is that the world tells us, you know, that when you struggle with something, keep it hidden. When you struggle with fear, when you struggle with anxiety, don't let the world know because that's a weakness. And so what's our solution? We just keep wrapping ourselves up more and more with these layers. We put on false fronts. We put on facades. But then, you know what? Slowly as we live for these superficial things, we ourselves become superficial. We become completely superficial because who we are on the outside is not who we are on the inside. We don't want the world to know what's going on on the inside. We want to hide away. And so we keep putting on these layers. We keep wearing all these masks. And, and I, I came across this quote a long time ago, but I think it's, it's so important. It says this, we all wear masks, but the time comes when we cannot remove them without removing some of our own skin. That we live in a world that everything, we must keep on putting these layers. We must show a, 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 a false front. But it comes to a point of time they were living so much for superficiality that we cannot remove that superficiality. And I believe that's why this Christmas season is so important. If anything, as I look at how we celebrate Christmas in the world now, like I said just now, there, there are two problems I can see very easily. Number one, we like the superficial things of this world. And some of us, we like it so much that we get totally consumed by it. And when we're consumed by it, it leads to the second problem is that we end up living for the superficial. And I believe that the Lord sees this, and I believe that, that what the Word of God says is that there's nothing new under the sun. I believe that all this while back, as you look through history, the Lord sees this problem among people. He saw this problem among people, and so He said, you know what, I need to send my son to give them the greatest gift of all, to let them know what is the greatest gift so that they will no longer have to struggle with this emptiness. They will no longer try and fill up this emptiness with the things of this world. And that is what Christmas is all about. Today, what I'm getting at church is this. In this season, everything looks like it's all wrapped up. The streets, our presents, our homes, the shopping centres, everything is all wrapped up. But perhaps... And this is for all of us, whether you're a Christian or not. Perhaps the real people who are wrapped up here is us. We have wrapped ourselves up with layers and layers and layers to hide the things within us. Maybe we've wrapped ourselves up because we're so focused on the superficial things. But if these are the problem, if the problem is that we're so superficial, we're so wrapped up with all these things, what is the solution? The solution today is this. It's time to peel off these superficial layers. You know, think of yourself as a Christmas gift. To get to what's inside, you need to remove the wrapping paper. And some of us, maybe we have a lot of different layers. It's time to start peeling off those layers. And that's why we must come to God. Because God is more concerned at, about who we are on the inside. That's why He says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Today, the Lord is looking at our hearts. And He's asking this, are you willing to surrender? What are these superficial layers that we've been wrapped up with? Work, our career, all sorts. I, I don't know what you're going through. We have all these different things. Are we willing to surrender? What it means to surrender is that we come to a point where we say, Lord, these things don't matter in my life anymore. These things are not important in my life. And that's the funny thing. It's almost like a paradox when you live your life as a Christian. Because Jesus says this in Matthew 16, 25. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Like I said last week, maybe this, this message is a continuation of last week's sermon. Last week was about letting go. And sometimes it's so funny. The moment we let go of something is when we truly actually have it. Don't you find that in about, about life? And I remember 
I said this last week, sometimes some of us, we struggle so much with letting go. There's some things that we hold on so tightly, we don't want to remove them. Why? Like you said, you know, it becomes part of us. We, we live in that superficial level. We hold it so tightly. And I remember I asked this important question last week. I said, if you hold on to something so tightly that you are not willing and you cannot let go of it, have you actually taken a hold of it or has it taken a hold of you? See, that is what superficiality is. It's when the things of this world takes a hold of us. But today, the Lord is saying, it's time to surrender. It's time to lay down these things. And that's a scary thought sometimes, to surrender. Because to us, if I say I surrender, it means that I concede, I'm defeated, I lose. But surrender is not about that. Surrender is about saying, God, I'm step out of the way. I want to trust you. And that's why this man by the name of Frank Cain, he made this statement, he says, we're never so vulnerable than when we trust someone. But paradoxically, if we cannot trust, neither can we ever find love or joy. And so, that's what Christmas is all about. Jesus came to set us free. He came to set us free. He came to help us be unwrapped. He came to help us open ourselves because it was so closed up. You see, very often we are so afraid of being vulnerable that we close ourselves up so tightly. And you know what's the problem? The good thing is this, when you close yourself up so tightly, yes, nothing can ever come and hurt you again. It feels like you're invulnerable. You close yourself so tightly, no new problem can come in and attack you. But you know what's the problem? Is that when you close yourself so tightly, whatever is already inside can never get out. Whatever emptiness is going to be there forever. Whatever anxiety is going to be there forever, it's only when we open ourselves up. Sure, it's a scary feeling because you're not going to know what's going to happen after that. But only when you let go and you surrender these things can the Lord come and do a supernatural work in your life. Church, this is what Christmas is all about. I don't know, I know, like I said, all of us, we have different understanding when it comes to Christmas. We have different... We, we, Christmas is significant to us in, our, in different ways. But I'd like to share with you what is, which verse in the Bible, to me, sums up what Christmas really is all about. It's not some verse about the angels appearing to, to Mary. It's not about the, the, the wise men or the shepherd. It's not even about the virgin birth. It's about this. It's a very familiar verse. And it says this, For God so loved the world, that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. This is Christmas. That when the Lord saw us, that we were stuck in, we, we, were, we have been taken a hold of by the superficial things of this world. Whether it's now or back then, some 2,000 over years ago, it's the same thing. We have the same struggle. We have a desire for the things of this world so much that they've taken a hold of us. But the Lord says this in John chapter 8, verses 31 to 32. If you hold on to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Today as we come, I believe that there are many of us, we need to be set free during this Christmas period. Some of us, we've not given our life to Jesus before, but you need to be set free. Set free from the deception the world has over us. Some of us, even as Christians, we have to be set free from this as well because these things have taken a hold of us. You know, if one thing I can share about being a Christian is what's this freedom all about? The freedom that God gives us he has never promised us freedom from problems or freedom from struggle. You know what He promises us? He promises us freedom through the problems, freedom through the struggles. See, many of us, we, we find, it, oh, freedom, to be free means, oh, I don't have all these problems anymore. But the way the Lord looks at it, it says, you will have all these problems, but throughout that, you will not feel defeated, you will not feel affected, you will not feel cast down, you will not feel weary, and you will not feel anxious. That is what freedom is that you can face these things head on, but they don't affect you like the rest, that it like affects other people. That is that freedom. You know, I want to close off this time today, just sharing with us a, a testimony that 
I've shared numerous times, but I feel that maybe some of us here, you've, it's your first time in church and you've never really heard this story before. But I wanted to share the story of, a, of someone who's familiar to us. And this is the story of Nick Vujicic. And I want to share this story because I think it's so important that as we look at this story, it's so applicable to, to this message. He lived a life of struggle. And this is his testimony. Nick was born on the 4th of December in 1982. And if you're familiar with Nick Voyages and, and FCBC, he came to minister to us a number of years ago. He was born with a very rare disease, which resulted in him being born without any limbs. And I got some photographs to just show you of it. This, this, this is Nick Voyages. He has no limbs, no arms, and no legs. And the moment he was born, it was a big struggle for his parents, and naturally for, for him, of course. In fact, they, they struggle so much. And this is the interesting thing that he shares in his testimony. That when his parents told their church, okay, they're part of a church, and they told them what had happened, the church came together and the whole church entered into a period of mourning. M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. They were mourning because they were saddened by this and they, they even had services to come together. And here, you, here Nick was just born. But yet he was born and there was no celebration all the people around him entered into a time of mourning instead. And so, it was a big struggle. His parents kept asking him, why would this happen? And as Nick grew up, he also started asking him, asking the same question, why would this happen? And Nick would always ask God, God, why did you take my arms and my legs? And why didn't you give me what everyone else has? And so Nick struggled to a point and in this interview, I remember him saying this. He said, God, if you are not going to end my struggle, you know what? Then I'm going to end the struggle myself. So he was a young boy. I believe he was, he was, he was not even 10 years old yet. And one day he was, in, he, he was taking a, a, a shower when his mom always helps him. He was just in that bathtub and she filled it with a little bit of water. And he said to her, you know what? I just want to just lay here for a while and just float in the water for, for a bit and... and he told the mom that she can go out and do her own stuff and, and he said anything I can just shout for you and so she went out and left him there and as he was in that bathtub he said that he wanted to flip himself over and you know, he was floating on his back he wanted to flip himself over and he said because if he flipped himself over in that water he would not be able to get out of it if he tried to drown himself that way because he has no arms and, and, and limbs. What happens when you try and drown? You start, your, your body starts grabbing things, but his body cannot grab anything. And so he tried to drown himself. But before he could do anything, he kept receiving this image of what would happen if he were to die. He saw a picture of his mom and his dad crying and, and how they were so affected and, so, and how they were blaming themselves for everything that happened. And so, on thinking of that, he felt he could not do that to his parents. And so, he did not kill himself. And even though that, at, at that young age, that would, that would be the last time he ever thought of killing himself. But it would not be the last time that he wished that his life would end, that everything would just finish. And you know, life was very harsh for Nick. Obviously, growing up without any arms or legs, that already is, is harsh. But you know what's the sad thing? The sad thing is that when I hear his story, he would go to school on his wheelchair and all that. And here you are, you look at this boy with no arms and no legs. Do you know that he was bullied in school? He was picked on, people would call him names, people would throw things at him. You would think that here you see someone with no arms and no legs, that people would have a bit more common sense to treat this person nicely. But no. If anything, he, he was being, it's almost like he was being punished extra. He was really punished that he doesn't have arms and, and, and any arms and legs. And then the world punishes him even more for not having arms and legs by making fun of him and making his life living hell. And so every day when Nick went, went home, he will keep praying. What is his prayer? He honestly will pray and he hoped that one day he will wake up and he will look at his body and he suddenly had arms and legs. That is what he was praying for. And one day, Nick was just flipping through a magazine and during that, in, as he flipped through that magazine, he read a story that will forever change his life. He read a story about this disabled man. And this disabled man was sharing his own journey about how he was paralyzed, but yet he made an interesting thing. He said he could either be angry at God for what he didn't have 
or he could be thankful for what he already did have. And that one line sunk into to Nick's heart. And that's when Nick learned that it didn't matter whether he had limbs or not. It didn't matter whether he had arms or legs or not. You know why? It didn't matter because he wasn't broken because of him not having any limbs. He was broken on the inside. And he felt that even if he had arms and legs, that wouldn't change anything in his life because he was broken on the inside. He didn't need superficial healing. He needed spiritual healing. And when he was 15, he read the Bible and he came across the, 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 the part about how Jesus healed a blind man. And this blind man was born blind. And people asked why this man was born that way. Why was he born blind? And Jesus said that this person was born in such a way so that the works of God may be revealed through even a blind man. And then it just kept reaffirming Nick. And Nick knew that his life was not a mistake that God had made. Even though he couldn't see it, but God had a great plan for him. And all this while, he kept asking God, God, why do you make me this way? Why am I born like that? And to which he finally got an answer to it. But the answer was not something that he expected. The answer that God gave was another question. When Nick asked, why am I born like this? God replied with this, Nick, do you trust me? Do you trust me? And Nick says this, you know, that when your answer to that is yes, then nothing else matters. It doesn't matter whether you don't have arms or legs. It doesn't matter whether you're not successful in the eyes of the world. Because you will receive the healing on the inside. You know, all this while, Nick says he was yearning for what the world had. He was yearning for what he was missing, so to speak. If anything, he was living in a very superficial way. He was living in a way that he felt that it is his arms and legs, his, his ability to look like a normal person, that is what will determine his happiness. That is what will determine his purpose and his passion in life. And so he shares with many people today that that is not true. That that's not what life is all about. And today, Nick, as he finally received that healing that he needed on the inside, he's doing great things for the Lord. He's traveling around the world and his staff say that as of a few years ago, it, it's, he has reached out to at least 200 over 1,000 people and brought them to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And Nick didn't need his arms and legs to do whatever the Lord's calling him to do. In fact, he needs no arms and no legs to be doing what God has called him to do. If you look at Nick right now as he lives, he's, he's found that fulfillment. His fulfillment doesn't come in the forms of arms and legs. His fulfillment comes in him having a beautiful wife, having two sons, in him going swimming, skydiving, preaching, surfing even. Because to him, this is it. He says these two very important things. And I've always held on to these two things in, in this interview that he, 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 he had. He says, In life you have a choice. Bitter or better. Choose better and forget bitter. And when it comes to his own life, he said this, I didn't need my circumstance to change. I don't need arms and legs. I need the wings of the Holy Spirit. I'm flying because I know Jesus is holding me up. So don't give up on God because God will never give up on you. This is what it means to live supernaturally. To live superficially, it means that we need our circumstances to change. We need this, our, the things around us to change for our benefit before life can have certain meaning. What Nick says here, it is that it's more important for him to change rather than for his circumstances to change. You know, church, this Christmas season, I believe that there are many of us seated here and over there in Suntech. 
we're caught up with the superficial things of life, whether we're a Christian or not. But I want to remind us about this. You know, maybe some of us, we are, we've been a Christian all our life, but yet now it comes to Christmas and just what we feel, just another year, another Christmas, another time, church asks us to bring people to, to come and, and, and hear and all that. Another time we have our I'll be home for Christmas celebrations and parties and all that. But maybe us too, we're caught up in all these superficial things. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it. But I'm saying, what does the Lord need to deal with inside your life? Because I want to tell this church, Christmas isn't meant to be a superficial season. It's meant to be a supernatural season for each and every one of us. And maybe sometimes that's why as Christians we don't have the excitement in our hearts about Christmas because we've not been living in a supernatural way. Today the Lord, He's calling us to turn away from the superficial and live in the supernatural. Because that's that's how he lived his life. That's how he has worked through the life of Nick. And that's the testimony that Nick has for each and every one of us. Today, let's not put our hope, let's not put our confidence, let's not put our faith in the things of this world. Even though these things may be seemingly good, and in fact, many of them are, but just like Nick, let's not put our hope and our confidence in, in his case, in arms and legs. For him, it's arms and legs. Maybe for some of us, it's something else. It's, maybe some of us, we feel lonely because we feel that we must have a relationship to feel happy, to feel fulfilled. Maybe some of us, we feel like, as we look at this Christmas season, as people, we look at all these advertisements say that you need to have more, have more of this, have more of that, and we suddenly feel a sense of lack. Well, buying more things is not going to solve that. Today, the Lord wants to come and work inside our lives. We can have all the money in the world, but money can be lost. We can have all the intellect in the world, but well, our intellect will one day fail us as well. We can have all the success in the world, but there will always be someone better who comes along. Even relationships, we can have all the relationships in, in the world. But you know that even relationships will fail at some point in time. Even good relationships will fail. You know why? Because we're mortal, we're finite. Eventually, we will pass away. But you know, God will never, ever pass away. And just like Nick encourages us, he says, don't give up on God because God will never give up on you. The devil's trying to trick all of us in this world. He wants us to put our, our hearts and our hopes in the superficial things of this world because when we do that, when we allow these things to take a hold over us, He can come and do what He does best. You know what the Bible says about the devil? In John chapter 10, verse 10, it says that he's a thief. He's a thief that what? That comes to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus says this, I have come as the good shepherd so that you will have life and you'll have it to the full. In some other Bible, it says you will have abundant life. Look at Nick Vujicic. Is he living an abundant life? Of course he is. But his abundance didn't come in the forms, in the form of hands and legs, arms and legs. For many of us here today, it's the same thing. You can have that abundant life. But today, we need to change on the inside. To us, we're thinking abundant life equals to me having this, having that. Today, the Lord wants to change all of that. He says the abundant life is about having Him. He is the good shepherd that comes to lay down His life for us. So what Christ, what's so merry about Christmas? What's so merry about Christmas is that Jesus came to set us free. So we no longer need to be wrapped up in the things of this world so that we can be set free. Christmas is so merry because God so loved the world that He gave 
His only begotten Son. And whoever believes in Him today shall not perish but have everlasting life because we will receive that abundant life, that abundant life that does not come in the things of the world but it comes in the form of His presence. And so as we close this service, I'm going to invite all of us right now, can we just close our eyes and bow our heads all over this place and over there in Suntec City as well. And I know that there are many of us here who are struggling with this. We have not opened up our hearts to receive of the greatest gift ever. But some of us, it feels like we cannot open up our hearts, we cannot open up our lives because we're so closed up, we're so wrapped up with the things of this world. Today the Lord says, I'm not looking at all those things. I'm not looking at what you've done or what you haven't done. I'm looking straight at your heart. And today, if you say that you're willing to surrender, you're willing to open up your life and allow Him to be your Lord. If you say today, that, Lord Jesus, I want to give my life to you, I guarantee you your life is never going to be the same again. And so if all our heads bow and all our eyes closed, I want to give us an opportunity to respond this morning. Here's how I'm going to let you respond. I'm going to let you respond by leading you in a short prayer. And how this is going to happen is this. I'm going to say this prayer out loud. I'm going to say it line by line. And I want all those of you who today you want to open up your life to Jesus, I want you to follow after me. Say everything I say, line for line as well. Say everything I say word for word. And I want the Christians among us to pray together as well so that we can pray together as a family. And maybe even for us Christians, it's a time of rededication because some of us, we know that we've been focusing on the wrong things in our lives. And so as I lead us in this time of prayer, those of you who've never given your life to Jesus before, today, come and respond. So I'm going to lead us in this prayer right now. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for your great love for me. Thank, thank you for your great, great love for me. me. I know I know, I know that you have a purpose for my life. That you have a purpose for my life. Today, today, I want to, to receive that purpose. I want to receive that purpose. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Today, today, I receive your love. I receive your love. I receive your presence. I receive your presence in my life. In my life. Today, today, I peel off all the layers. I peel off all the layers. I cast them aside. I cast them aside. And Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come, Come into, into my, my heart. heart. I open it up to you. I open, I open it up to you. you. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive, Forgive me, me of my sins. sins. Be my Lord. Be, Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my, Be my Savior. Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Thank, Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. And with all our heads bowed and all our eyes still closed, I believe that there's some of us who pray this prayer for the first time today. And if that's you, that's what I'm going to do. In a moment's time, I'm going to count to three. And when you hear me count one, two, and three, at the count of three, those of you who pray this prayer for the first time today, I want to invite you to lift your hands straight up wherever you are. Whether you're here, you're up in the balcony, or you're over there at Suntec City, I want you to lift your hands straight up. And by lifting your hand, you're saying, Pastor, I pray this prayer for the first time today. Come, pray for me as well. And so when you lift your hands straight up, I can see where you are. I can, I can, I can, I can pray for you as well. And maybe there's some of us here you didn't pray along with me, but maybe you were quietly praying along. Well, why don't you lift your hand straight up as well? Maybe you didn't even do anything, but right now you know that you want to make this decision as well. At the count of three, you lift your hand straight up as well so that I can pray for you. So I'm going to count right now. Both here and over there at Suntec, don't let this opportunity pass you by. I'm going to count. One, two, three. Just lift your hand straight up wherever you are. Over here. In, 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 in touch center yes I can see your hand over there up in the balcony as well I can see your hand up there in the balcony over there at, at Suntech City as well I can see you through the camera just put your hand up wherever you are I want to come and pray a prayer of blessing for you don't put your hand down yet just lift it up is there anyone else just come and allow the Lord to minister to you at this point in time just keep your hand lifted up I want to pray for you right now Lord I thank you for these hands that have been lifted up because Lord I know that every hand lifted up represents a life and it represents a soul and Lord, today as they come and they receive this, Lord, let them know that the greatest gift of this season is knowing you. And then Lord, today as they make this decision, we want to declare that their lives will never be the same again. Because Lord, you have promised them 
that no matter what they are facing, no matter what situation they're in, Lord, they still have that abundant life that comes from you and you alone. So we commit them into your hands. In Jesus' most mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Can we just stand over here and, and at Touch Centre and over there in, in Suntech? And I just I saw a few hands that were lifted up and I'm not sure about over there at Suntech City, but this is what I'm going to do. In a moment's time, I'm going to count to three again. And this time when I count to three, the moment you hear me say three, all those of you who lifted up your hands, I want to invite you, grab your belongings and make your way down to the front over here where I am. There's a pastor going to be here over there at Suntech. Uh, pastor Melissa is there as well. You make your way down to the front. You're not going to come alone, but the friends who brought you, they'll be happy to come down with you. We want you to come forward because we want the whole church to pray a prayer of blessing for you. All right? And even if you didn't lift up your hands, but you want to respond, tell your friends who are around you that you want to come up, they'll come up with you. Even if no one brought you, Tell the people beside you, they'll come down with you. And FCBC members, if you brought a friend today, why don't you ask them, would you like to respond? If you would, I'll come up with you, all right? So I'm going to count to three. At the count of three, let's welcome them. Ready? One, two, three. Come on, just grab your stuff and make your way down to the front here so that the whole church can pray for you. Over there at Sun Tank, here at Touch Centre, just come on down from the balcony. We'll wait for you. Just make your way down uh, uh, to the front here. Let's come on down, we'll wait for you. Praise God, hallelujah. Just come, just come. Just, just, just look at me for a moment. I just want to share with you that, that you know, today is definitely a very special day for you because your life will never be the same again. And sometimes many of us, we have this idea that we want people to come to church and we're going to tell them that, oh, come and be a Christian and, and your life will be smooth sailing for the rest of your life. I mean, never any problems. But you know what Jesus said? Jesus said that in this world, we will have trouble. There will be problems in this life. But he says, take heart, don't worry. He has already overcome the world. He will teach us. He will help us overcome these things. And so what I'll promise you is this. Throughout whatever you may face in life, you will not be free from these problems, but you will be free throughout these problems. You will have that sense of freedom. While the world says you should be sad, you should be depressed, you should be anxious, you will be free from all that. And because of that, you will have that victory. Because the Lord's promise for you is that He will never leave you nor abandon you. So we want to pray for you. So can I just invite you to close your eyes and bow our heads. And church, let's stretch our hands towards our friends who have responded this morning. And let's come and just speak a word of blessing over them. Lord, we thank you for the lives here who have responded this morning. We know that you're doing a great work in their lives. We commit them into your hands. We ask that you bless them in everything that they do. Bless them in their studies, in their work, in their relationships with their friends and their family. And let them know without a doubt that Lord, you are all they need. So today we speak the Lord's promise over your life that He has given you not just life but life to the full. He has given you that abundant life. So we speak this upon you. We commit you into the Lord's hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Just follow Pastor Simon for a while. He'll bring you outside. We're going to continue praying for you. And church, let's thank the Lord for their lives. from our intercessors here but I just feel led to share this that the reason we wanted to have this series at the end of the year of course one great thing is we can bring our friends and we can hear about what Christmas is all about but one thing as our team came together we are just discussing what to share during this series is that we just felt a lot saying to us even among, within the church there are many of us who don't look forward to Christmas that Christmas is another reminder of another failed year 
Christmas is a reminder of another year of being alone. Christmas is another reminder of how we don't have enough in our lives. And I believe that many of us feeling this way because there are, there's so many words from the intercessors here talking about this. Loneliness, we're feeling that life is meaningless. And some of us here, we feel, we feel like that nobody loves us. But the Lord here says today that you're my beloved son, you're my beloved daughter. In you, I am well pleased. The Lord here says, you're not forsaken. And it, it's, it's the same, so, so many of these words, you're not alone. The Lord here, this is the same word that came last night and this morning again, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For well, some of us were struggling with that. The Lord wants to set us free from this. And if anything, this word that the intercessors gave me yesterday, I think this is what I want to share for all of you. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. Today, when you hear His word, do not harden your heart. Do not harden your heart. I honestly believe that there's some of us here, we heard last week's message about letting go, but we've not actually let go. Well, the good thing for you is that I think God is not letting go of you. He's telling you that that thing that you cannot let go of today, you're going to keep hearing about that until you, you let it go. Because that's what He wants you. He wants to set you free. And church, today, I want to remind us again that this is what Christmas is all about. Lord, we're going to pray for our brothers and sisters who have responded this morning. And Lord, whatever they're going through, Lord, we ask that you give them that, that spirit of confidence. Lord, we thank you for all that you've, you've shared with us over the past few weeks that, that Lord, we can take that step of faith and Lord, we can let go. And we can allow you to come and lead us through every single situation. So Lord, over their lives right now, we speak that spirit of freedom. We declare that they have that abundant life that comes from you. And Lord, today we want to commit ourselves afresh to you. Can we just lift up our hands in a posture of surrender? Lord, we ask that you forgive us. That even as leaders, as pastors as Christians Lord very often we too we get caught up with the superficial things very often we get caught up with even playing the religious game rather than allowing ourselves to be transformed by your goodness and your grace every single day of our lives so Lord we ask for your presence to come upon us that in this season Lord we will remember throughout everything that this is the greatest season of all because this is a time that we can remember, we can come and receive of your presence. Lord, we ask that you come and change us from the inside out. That Lord, we will no longer focus on living in the superficial, but Lord, we will focus on living in the supernatural because your presence is here with us. Your presence will never leave us nor forsake us. So we commit ourselves afresh into your hands. Lord, we commit the next few weeks into your hands as well. That as we bring our friends, as we invite our friends, that Lord, we're going to see many people coming to know you. That Lord, as we have our different parties, we're going to see, Lord, people's lives being touched, being changed. We're going to see open doors in this season ahead. And Lord, you're good. we're going to see you using us to do your supernatural work wherever you have placed us. So we commit ourselves afresh into your hands. We thank you. We pray all this in your most mighty name. Amen. Amen. Let's just praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God bless you. We'll see you next week as you make your way out. Tell someone beside you, bring a friend next week and we'll see you back here for the rest of this series. And if you still need to be prayed for, continue to be prayed for. God bless you.